welcome to another episode of the Anime Village Podcast. We are joined by our co-founder, Brian Soroka, and we are joined by also a reoccurring guest, a reoccurring guest Jason Seegers. Jason, welcome back to the show. What's up, man? Good to be here. Yeah, happy to have you back on. Um, Brian and Jason, this is the first time you're meeting, so mm-hmm. I know Brian watched your episode when it, when it came out and when you were on the show before, and uh, Jason's a you know, big anime fan, big, uh, big manga fan. So Jason, why don't you just give Brian a background about your anime fandom and where it all began? Yeah, man. Uh, so anime for me, I kind of grew up alongside anime, uh, discovered it middle school, sixth grade, seventh grade, something like that. And kind of just fell in love. It was kind of a love at first sight kind of thing. And, uh, you know, with DBZ coming out around that time, um, it was just easy for me to kind of just fall in love and fall into the lore of uh, anime with the extravagant fights and, you know, the, the fight scene was always crazy. So that was fun for me. And uh, as I got older, it just anime just never wore off. <laughs> it just stayed on me. Tell me about it. I love yeah. it. <laughs> I love it. And Brian, why don't you uh, give us a background to being the chief lore officer, speaking of lore that Jason mentioned that uh, of our of uh, anime village what your uh, anime background is and a little bit of what AV is doing sure uh, my first foray foray into anime was god going back a long long time to a series called Gachman which is um, known as battle of the planets in North America it was the bird wow. people yeah. yeah that was the first thing and I was very very young but I do remember there was this difference between this and what I would watch on Saturday mornings. It was just, there was more energy. It was more dynamic. It was just, there are all these different things going on. And it just, the animation was just far superior. I even recognized that at a young age. And from that moment, just like you, I was just completely hooked, right? Just like sourcing and looking. I mean, it was a bit different back in the day. This is pre-internet. So we actually had to go looking for, for stuff. Um, it was even like pre VHS days where you couldn't rent this stuff. Right. So you'd have to um, either go to the library and you'd like rent film strips of it, or, you know, it, it was just, um, it was not readily, readily available. Let's put it that way. But like I said, that was really my first kind of into it. And then other stuff that was Americanized, but still manga, I call it, or story anime, like Thundercats and Silverhawks and things like that um and and then we got you know um what other shows did we get dragon ball z came to the fore and just just getting into all that and it's just <clears throat> i don't know it's just the energy i think is really what captured captured me and and stay it stays with me till this very day so you know the stuff that we're producing is definitely um a love letter to those to those um shows and those books fr- from back then and what we're doing is really um my partner and I, Gary, is our goal and what we're achieving is creating a new experience for anime, manga, and gaming fans. And we've created a process that we call REPS, which stands for Read, Explore, Play, and Stream. You read our manga, you explore our, mo- our mobile games, you play our JRPGs, and then further down the line, when we have enough equity built into the IP, you um, stream our limited anime series that are based on our characters. Uh, I was telling Jeff just before we started recording, I I was seeing some of um, the character designs for our mobile game. We're going to have a demo ready in the next month to 60 days. So I want to put that out there. Very excited about that. And just finishing up um, with the JRPG planning document, which has grown to about 211 pages now. Um, So it just, it's very in-depth. But what we're doing that's very different is that unlike... Uh, let's say you have a manga that comes out and then they create a game out of it, right? So they base it on obviously that property and they have the characters featured in the book. What we're doing is we're following the story beat for beat. So volume one of Adamanto is our shonen title and it's 264 pages. All 264 pages are going to be in the games. In fact, we're even expanding upon it because we're introduce, introducing different characters and different um, actions that you don't see in the manga. And what we're also doing is, um, sorry, I know I'm going on for a no, bit, but good. I'll oh, finish God. up in a sec. The uh, mobile game, so the mobile game is called Adamanto Unleashed, and then we have the JRPG, which is called Adamanto Bodo. 
um, they're interoperable. So if you're playing Unleashed and you earn or um, you purchase upgrades, weapons, skills, whatever the case may be, you can use them in the JRPG and vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. And we're also going to be introducing some Web3 elements. So, you know, if you're into digital wallets and you're into the crypto thing, all good. If not, you can go traditional, whichever way you want. Um, but really what sets us apart, I think, is the depth of the storytelling because Adamanto, as Jeff will attest to, he's seen some of it, is um, it's absolutely amazing. It really, really is. Just we we took about a year researching the book and then writing the book. And like I said, volume one is 264 pages and better still, we've got an artist named Oscar Jimenez who's working on it right now. Oscar is from Aquaman fame. He's worked on The Flash, Wolverine, big, big MAGA fan. This is his real first foray into it. So yeah, we're we're, we're hitting on all cylinders. That's awesome. That's a lot though. <laughs> That's super cool. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's awesome what they're doing on what we're doing and like being able to see the change and also what Oscar has drawn and new characters and everything like that. And Adamanto being the story. I, I know Brian sent me the back script of what uh, of going on in the new story. I've been reading it and it's just awesome when I have downtime and it's fantastic once you get. I forgot to I, ask you about that. Yeah. <laughs> if you're enjoying it. Yeah. yeah. It's been, it's been great. Cause I just sit down and like, I, I wanted to read more and it's been good for me to like, when I have like a break, not to just be scrolling through Instagram or TikTok or whatever, like looking at things I'm actually reading and using my brain instead of just looking at videos. Um, oh, yeah, but Jason, you being an anime fan and what Brian just told you about what we have going on here at, at Anime Village, you want to get your thoughts and like, what do you think of like everything just being expanded out like that? I know the that concept, I you know, I have different kinds of friends, right? So I have my, my gaming and nerdy friends, like, this is what we do. Like, we sit around and talk <laughs> possible IPs that we would never create or just, you know, I remember we were all into Naruto, right? And it was like, how cool would it be to play the Naruto game and progress through the story along with, you know, the anime or the manga or, or whatever? And that idea is just, you basically took something out of our brains and made it real. Uh. <laughs> well, you know what it, it, it's funny you say that because we always say like myself gary and, and jeff too it's like our job is much easier because we're fans too so if we're digging it if we're reading something and it makes us smile if we're watching something and it makes us giggle you can be sure there are other people out there that feel the exact same way so when we're doing the writing when we're doing the illustrations and all that and we're we're liking it we know other people are going to like it as well Sure. I mean, the fans are going to go for that for sure, right? Because if you go, if you like the manga, you're going to like the anime. If you like the anime, you're going to like the game, and so on and so forth. And now well, you just yeah, get. I mean, we released the first chapter maybe about six months ago, and it was drawn by another artist, Kevin Briones, who did an amazing job. Um, but we just wanted to get it out there and start getting people familiar with the lore. And it's been, I think, we're up to sixty-five thousand now people that have read the the first chapter. So that's chapter one of volume one, and there's 12 chapters in volume one that are coming. So wow. again, you'll see the, the breadth of storytelling that we're pushing into the games, right? And think of the mobile game as a teaser to the JRPG. Right. Right. That's, so everything is interconnected. That's cool. And that's what that's what we're, we've been missing. And I feel like I've experienced games that have tried to do something similar and either failed in one aspect or the other, or they just don't put enough time into one thing or the other. You know what I mean? I think it's the latter, simply because th there are a ton of great, great games out there, right? But I honestly think that the storytelling aspect is lacking. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. Again, there are some great examples, like God of War is a great example of an expansive story, right? That they took the time at the front end to develop, and then they developed the game out of that. But, you know, I've spoken to other independent developers that, you know, were, were pitching their stories to us or their properties to us. And it's like, OK, show me, like, give me all the information you have on your story. And they'd send me like a three or four page outline. That's all they had. Mm. Like, I've got 10 page outlines per character. <laughs> now we have... 18 main characters and then 28 supporting characters and then another 36 recurring characters. And that doesn't include all the other stuff. So 
the one thing I would say to people is when you are developing manga, when you are developing these games, you've got to take the time at the beginning and develop and flesh everything out. Otherwise, everything falls flat later on, right? And fans fans can can see that, right? Like you'll see all these, you know, Demon Slayer and and even you know Chainsaw Man and all these you know more popular recent titles. Um, the storytelling is pretty deep. Although I will say Adamanto goes even deeper than those guys. Oh, okay. Well, we're stepping up to the big dogs. <laughs> well, big dogs in that they're very popular and they've done very well yeah. for themselves. But it's it's just, I think with Adamanto, it's the right way for doing things. And we're, we're doing that with um, the th three other genres that we've identified. Because when we began, we knew like as fans ourselves, this makes life easier. We can see things for what they were. So we know, you know, some guys are into shonen, into action, some are into supernatural, slice of life, um, adventure. So those are the four key genres that we identified. And we're rinsing and repeating the cycle with everything. So we're, we're actually working on our supernatural title now called Undead Reckoning. And that's going to have the manga. And then we're going to have the mobile, the JRPG, and then the anime. And it's also interconnected with uh, Adamanto because some of the characters are related, right? So we're creating, everything is connected through the storytelling in okay. some way, shape or form. That's cool. So let, let me ask you this. So <clears throat> talk about uh, having a, a manga anime release at the same time as a game. Uh, how much involvement do the manga people have? You know, how does that relationship go across those two different like mediums? They go hand in hand because Another distinction that we, I, I think, that we um, have to offer is that we use the manga as a storyboard for the games. Okay. So Oscar gives us the pages, we give it to the development team, they check it out, and they use that when it comes to developing the cinematics, when it comes for the gameplay, obviously the character design and all that stuff. So it's really, um, the manga su serves two, two purposes, or three really, because it's a marketing tool. But it's also obviously for people to read, but it's also a storyboard for the development of the games. It's like, I don't know why more people don't do it this way. Maybe right. because they don't follow the story so closely. That's what I was about to say. How, I mean, because there's different ways you can look at it, right? So you can take the manga and make that the base and in the game, go this way, go that way. You don't necessarily mm -hmm. have to follow the same story that that's in the manga, but stay in the same universe, but you still got that manga there if you want to go back and, and read it as like a fan. So yep. that's pretty cool, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is work intensive and there's so many details and, you know, I's you got to dot and T's you got to cross, but it's worth it, right? Because again, it's like, it allows us also to release more content more frequently. So the idea with the mobile game is we're going to release updates on a monthly basis. Right. So you're not going to sit there, play it and say, OK, I'm done and then move on to the next thing. We want to keep introducing the new characters, the new storylines, all of that. And that's where those 264 pages of content really come in handy. How, hey, like how does how does releasing content work? Like, you know, <laughs> is, is one thing going to get ahead of the other? Is, is the manga just kind of like the, the bones and you're going to put the meat, you know, having all that content is definitely going to help, though, definitely for as a fan. I want the more content for me, the better. Yeah, and, and that's volume one. We're we're also working on volume two, right? Which will be another 260. It might actually be a bit longer because um, we have a bunch of stories that we left unfinished in the first volume that we have to address. Plus we have to create the new stuff, right? So, and it's escalating, right? Um, Jeff and I have had many conversations about storytelling and I always say storytelling is quite simple because it only has three parts, right? It has a situation, has an escalation, and has a resolution. Um, but we focus on that second part, which is escalation, right? So in Adamanto Volume 1, the escalation is he faces three, um, the Yamato clan, which is Shinichi Tanzo, who's the chief protagonist. He belongs to the Yamato clan. They go out to take on the Tang Dynasty, um, the House of Frostbane, which are kind of like Vikings, and then you have the Byzantine Empire. Each escalates in the level of threat. Volume two is going to make volume one look like a children's party, right? <laughs> because we're going to have more, more threats, bigger threats introduced. So yeah, it just keeps ratcheting up and up and up and up. 
because um, the one thing you've got to be aware of is reader fatigue, right? It's kind of like um, you, you've read Spider-Man and you see him go up against Doc Ock for the 600th time. And it's like, all right, now what? Or, you know, Superman going up against Brainiac. You got to you gotta introduce new stuff on a regular basis. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the, one of the cool things about Adamanto is there's a lot of like historical figures involved in it and which oh. is like a r really cool part of it. And like there's some Greek pathology. <laughs> and I think that's like one of the biggest things I I'm excited about, too, about it and from reading it as well, too, because I'm a big history buff and I love like all the old ancient stuff and reading about that and then getting it in my <laughs> manga and seeing these characters come to life is is pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah, and those, I mean, different takes on, like, I think that different takes on historical mythology is different depending on who you ask. And seeing a different take on the same character is also really cool. Like, you're touching different cultures, different countries, and that's pretty interesting. Yeah, and when it comes to introducing the different cultures or the different mythology, um, we've taken Greek mythology, um, but for the most part, we take characters from the mythology that are not that well known aside from a couple of examples like for instance perseus um pretty much everybody's heard of perseus zeus of course and the 12 main gods but in volume two um the yamoto clan is going against these gods of war that probably nobody's ever heard of but actually exist right mm -hmm. so um and other characters like oda nobunaga lord kami to a certain extent um, Abe no Semai, who is um, the master magician in volume one. These are all characters that exist in Japanese lore, right? We just kind of create our own take on them, our own version of them, right? That's cool. Like Lu Bu, when I first uh, started playing Dynasty Warriors, like, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's just like, <laughs> I remember, like, it was just like, who is Lu Bu? Like, I wanted to go and Google and then yeah. see, like, the real, the real historical figure as to how they're portrayed in my my game or book or whatever. That's yeah. cool. I love it. I love it too. When uh, and that's funny you bring up Lou because they brought him in record of record of Ragnarok too. Yeah, and they brought him in that. I was like, I know who this guy is because the dynasty. It's Lou <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> So pumped up about it, but it's it's awesome that the 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 mobile game and the JRP jrpg is related as well too and i think that's a cool aspect i think what anime village and what we're doing here is we're creating a world that's just not a linear where you're just stuck just reading the manga and you're watching the anime but you can also go hop into a video game and jump into it and play as a character i know as a kid and i think you mentioned it jason as well too is growing up i always wanted to like i couldn't wait for budokai to come out for <laughs> Dragon Ball Z, like, because I wanted to play as those characters so much. I was like, man, I can't wait. I want to be Beerus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Now, Brian, for the RPGs, it's still like the, you're, you don't, you level up the weapon, right? It's not yourself. You have to use a skill, right? Is that still Yeah, going? that was something we, we wrestled with. Typically, when you play pretty much any kind of game, especially JRPGs, right, you'll start leveling up, whether it's like you acquire new weapons or your skills or, or whatever the case may be. But the, the, the main character, Shinichi Tanzo, he starts off as a Master Bushi, right? A Master Samurai already. So we thought it was silly that you would upgrade your skills and your abilities because he's already there. So when he dons the Nexus, it's what you up is your knowledge of how to use it, right? And how to tap into its power and its abilities, right? Because if you don't know what you're doing, you can do more damage than you can do good because it's that kind of, you know, ultimate kind of weapon where it's like almost, I always use the analogy of the chimp with the AK-47, right? It, it's like, you've got this, thing this creature that has this weapon and it's like what are you going to do with it are you going to do something for good or are you going to do some more damage so that's kind of what what distinguishes the game as well where it's like you have to learn um how to use this weapon that you've been given as opposed to you know getting other weapons and upgrading those and upgrading your skills or acquiring new abilities that's awesome. think, which i think is a cool part of it because it's like you never i haven't played i never played an mm -hmm. rpg where you had to level up with a weapon. Like you don't start out as like a master samurai or swordsman. It's always you level up the character. And yeah, always... yeah. And, and that we wrestled with that for a while, to be honest, simply because, you know, it's like 
Shinichi is an older character, right? He's not a teenager. He's not 16. Like he's in his 40s. And so he's been doing, he's a salty dog. He's been doing this <laughs> for a while. And, um, you know, also the weapon, the Nexus, is also like nothing that you'd want to level up because it's already there, right? It taps into, you know, these demon sources and it's also made of um, adamantine. So the connection between Perseus, he had a sword named Harpe, right? Which he used to kill the Gorgon Medusa and do all his other things. Um, the weapon was made of what was called adamantine. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's because Wolverine, adamantium claws, that's where they got that from. In Greek mythology, adamantine is described as almost like a mineral, like a diamond, or sometimes it's like an ore, an alloy, a metal. Um, we use it as like it's this indestructible um, metal. So the Yamoto clan steals the sword, they melt it down, they commingle it with an ancient form of blood magic to create the nexus of adamanta, which are these gauntlets that Shinichi puts on and makes him the biggest badass of all time, right? But he has to learn how to use it. Because he is not a big fan of magic, but he's forced into this situation because his father was killed by a sorcerer. We get into oh. that further down the line. They're all this back and forth. And that's another thing about deep storytelling is all of these kind of like little subtexts that you add and sprinkle in throughout and you 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 address and then you leave and then you come back to it later on. That's what I've always been a fan of. Nice. That's cool. Oh, I do have one question. Yep. I, I <clears throat> so how much so we have the core story the main story right and we have all these different stories going around the different uh genres like you said how much overlappage is there from like adamanto and the slice of life and the supernatural that's going on concurrently or is it like how does that work it's not concurrently so the best example i can give you is between adamanto and undead so Adamanto takes place in 12th century. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, we have one of the main characters, name is Abe no Semai. In Undead Reckoning, it takes place in modern times today. It's contemporary. The main character is Ero no Semai, who is the great, 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 add as many greats as you want, grandson of Abe, right? And it was actually kind of when we were writing it, it was how close of a connection do we want to have this? And it just kept get, getting stronger and stronger simply because we love the characters. And if it was organic and it didn't seem forced, why not do it? So we actually, the main villain in Undead is Lord Kami from Adamanto, oh. right? Because he's been killed. So the premise for, I'll just give the, the quick premise for Undead. Um, is in 2011, and this was actually uh, happened in Honshu, there was a devastating earthquake. It killed like 18,000 people. Um, it was like a magnitude 9.2 quake. So we go back to 2011, and what we say is when the earthquake created that huge fissure, it opened up a gateway to Yomi, which is land of the dead. All of these spirits started escaping, so they cordon off all of Honshu with a 350 foot enchanted wall to keep them in. So they can't, you know, obviously get out and run amok. They start breaking through and that's where Arrow comes in and he's got some other spirits that he deals with. Um, but when I was mentioning the escalation again, we have another character who is the great, 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 great granddaughter of uh, Shinichi. And she's the only one who can wear the gauntlets that can take these spirits down. Because again, there's that connection between Abe and when his lifeblood incantation. It's there's a lot more to it than that, but that's the gist of it. That's awesome. That's the, I I love that. I love that stuff. Everything. Yeah, we do too, right? Like I can't help smiling about it. It's just like it's got that. It's just great storytelling, right? And it's yeah. um, interesting and interconnected. But the one thing we want to make sure to do is that you can enjoy them on their own, right? It's mm -hmm. not like the Marvel way of doing things where, you know, you have um, an event and you have to pick up every damn book. Because right. Otherwise, you don't know what's going on, right? This way, if you, you're digging Adamanto, okay, you might like this, right? Or you might not because Supernatural might not be your thing. I wasn't the huge Supernatural thing, but as I'm writing this title, it's become one of my favorites. Mm, cool. So, That's cool. I love that idea. I love that yeah. idea. 
yeah, I think it's it's working really, really well. And uh, anyone we bounced it off of and and kind of like that interconnected universe. I mean, it's done been done before, right? You know, Marvel did it with their their especially with their movie universe. Um, they tried doing it with the Universal Monsters, and there's been lots of interconnected universes. But what we strive for is again, it's not forced, and it doesn't force people to you got to get this and all of this other stuff to to get that experience right it makes it better but you don't need one to enjoy the other is, right. is what i'm trying to say that's the best way to do it i don't want to be confused like <laughs> you know, have those times when you, you you're like who is that guy and everybody's like stunned and you're the only one that doesn't know what's going on like it shouldn't be that strong it should be okay <laughs> It says everybody else knows, but I am getting to learn this character on my own. It has its own thing in this in this timeline. So yeah, it's cool. Super cool. That's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. It's a great to have that connection. I think it's really cool. All the development. I love the the deep storytelling as well too. That there's more to these characters, especially in like the supernatural, um, and them being connected to the Adamanto characters. Uh, Jason, what kind of like with all the genres and types of mangas that we have, what kind of mangas do you enjoy or like do you enjoy to read the most? Oh, man. I mean, superpowers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, action. You'll love great. Adamanto then. That's what I'm saying. But uh, I got into uh, so so Death Note was really good to me. And I started to get into the psychological um, side of anime. So I watched like Psychopaths, I watched uh, Gantz. Obviously, I watch less actiony animes like Cowboy Bebop. That's an opera. And someone say that's an opera. So, uh, yeah, action and a little bit of like you know, like drama, a little bit of drama, you know, with a, with a touch of action. Yeah, yeah. You would definitely love Adamanto, and I'm sure we'll try to get you into the supernatural as well too. I mean, if you like Yu Yu Hakusho, I mean, that's supernatural, right? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't be. I might get into Slice of Life. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's, that's the one I can't get into. That's the one I, I don't know why I just can't get into it. <laughs> have you tried it though? I have. I really have, and it's it's kind of like I don't know. I, I just if I'm gonna go for drama or comedy or things like that, I'm gonna probably watch like a a, a show, like a typical show, or I probably I don't know. I just it never hit struck me in manga or because <clears throat> I'm a huge fan of dialogue right strong dialogue and that's also kind of where we stray a bit where it's you know even when i was a kid and i remember watching gotcha Man or battle of the planets i remember wow they're they're talking kind of weird right because it was translated by someone who's japanese who didn't speak english as the first language so you get that bit of broken kind of english in certain places um, and you get that in a lot of, of the um, anime today, right? Where the dialogue is kind of stilted, right? It doesn't flow. So, and, and some people will say, well, yeah, but you know what? That's the charm of anime. But, you know, as a writer, I'm, I'm a huge fan of dialogue and strong dialogue that really propels and adds to the mood and, and to the story. So when you read Adamanto, the dialogue is quite strong, Right. It's spoken as, you know, somebody would in 12th century Japan, but at the same time, um, when we go into the anime phase of things, it's going to be that same kind of um, level of dialogue, right? The same thing with Undead and all of the titles that we do. I don't see why you can't have both, is what I'm trying to say. Because... Like that, especially those early days, that was definitely, uh, <laughs> you could tell the difference, yeah. you know, on the, uh, the subs and the dubs. <laughs> dubs were always... <laughs> And the, the subs were usually the best way to experience the anime, like like Death Note. I couldn't imagine watching Death Note in English. So. Yeah, uh, it's funny you mention that because I had an experience like that recently. The first time I watched uh, One Punch Man, it mm. was dubbed because it's the only copy that I could find. And it was good. Like, I, like I'm a big superhero geek, like Jeff knows. Like, <laughs> that's how I started off reading Marvel books, right? Daredevil, Hulk, Avengers, Fantastic Four, all that stuff. And uh, I just recently watched it again in Japanese. And it was so much better in Japanese. It was like not even close. The <laughs> other, except I will shy away from it because I find when I'm reading subtitles, I miss a lot of the action. 
So I got to watch it again. You know what I mean? Like there's a really cool scene or or, or something that happens that I got to rewind and watch it again. But yeah, it was in Japanese. It was head and shoulders 10 times better. You could read that better. You haven't activated your Sharigan yet. That's okay. <laughs> it'll, it'll activate. Don't worry. Just, um, when you get a little bit older. <laughs> I, yeah, I I remember them talking. I think it was the DBZ, the, the one that came out on Cartoon Network, and they were they and then before they redid it with the Kai and everything. And I remember the voice actors were like, yeah, it was a little kind of like the voice acting was a little like tough because of like how they translated it. There were some times you'd be like that. Even watching you, like I that I did I miss something that doesn't make sense of what that why they just said why that response was like that compared to what he just said to yeah. him. Sometimes <laughs> it gets a little lost in translation. Yeah. yeah. That's how, that's how it goes that's cool i love it but uh last question we'll, we'll wrap it up but jason yourself being an athlete um and you know knowing athletes and you know and seeing the growth of anime what's it been like for you to see the growth of anime what's it like for you to watch it watch basketball or watch a game or know a like a, an nba player or a friend who plays professional basketball and see them wearing anime gear and what's it been like to see the growth of anime overall and in, in, in come to life here <laughs> yeah that's that's why i say i grew along anime i mean anime was one thing already but in, in america it was more like a, a cult thing you know it wasn't you know <laughs> seeing make its way into pop culture into mainstream media into shoes i mean mainstream shirts and i mean just guys brands making their way into guys brands is something that's uh that's incredible for me. So I, I went from hiding my anime, like uh, riding on buses and like sitting in the corner, you know, watching my recently torrented stream and, or, or whatever. And now it's like, everybody's watching anime. And I'm like, you're not an OG. You just thought it and it's cool now, but I was doing it before. <clears throat> I'm an anime hipster. So yeah, <laughs> bro, into pop culture is something that I thought would never happen, but it, it's good that it, that it has. I can wear this shirt proudly, you know. I can wear uh, my there's no need to hide <laughs> anymore. <laughs> definitely, definitely not. And then to follow up upon that, with everything that anime village is doing, mangas, games, um, maybe eventually down the line, animes on top of it, what we have going on. What would you think of like your friends who are into anime or friends that are trying to get into anime would think about anime village and being able to get into it? I think the concept is something that uh, we have been waiting on. I'm going to speak for all of my friends right now that we have been waiting on for a long time because we always wanted to to be in Konoha and, and walk around the village and, and, and live the story rather than just kind of just watch the story. Yeah. And uh, that element is something that is different, one. And as long as you do it right, I think that people will really take to it. I think it's an awesome idea. You guys are fans. We're fans. Fans making, you know, fan stuff. It's always good. You can definitely, I always say you can feel the love, right? That's what we want to do. That's what we want. <laughs> I love it. Well, yeah. I love it. Well, thank you guys so much for your time today. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for, you know, giving us the background and everything that's going on and all the news and updates and everything that's going on with, uh, with Anime Village. And Jason, thank you so much for, you know, making time and joining us. I, I know we've tried a couple of times and, and someone someone's work kept getting in the way. Um, but <laughs> but I appreciate you both and thank you guys. All right, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate right. it. Thank you. Bye guys.